Welcome officially once again to Dunamis Retreat United Kingdom. Please, I thought you'd do that better. All right, I would like to us to welcome our um, audience watching online as well. Can you celebrate people watching online? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before I go into today's teaching, I would just like to share a testimony with you guys. Um, I remember in year 2016, 17, I was in University of Lauren teaching hospital. I used to share my story a lot because I believe a lot of people would draw encouragement from it. Um, I was in University of Lauren teaching hospital, Kwa State in Nigeria. I finished school in OAU doing my internship as a physical therapist. And then in that land, I felt, oh, this is freedom at last, freedom from my parents, freedom from the familia. And then I went to do internship and that year the Lord um, said to start a teaching ministry in Illinois. That was my first time of stepping into ministry fully. That was in the year 2017, January. And then we started, it was like a fellowship in just my living room back then. It was a residential quarters for interns. It was back then in my living room. We started from like six or seven, we increased to 10 to 14 to 25. We kept on growing and you know internship was just for a year i was going to you know go for my youth service um then it was november my internship was supposed to end on the i think on the 6th or 7th of november we had already applied for um youth service out I, I was posted to benin city uh, edo state in nigeria so well my, me, my colleagues and i were planning to leave but everyone was excited and i remember i kept having this unrest in my spirit like i'm not supposed to leave the plan was the guy assisting me who is now a pastor in my spiritual father's church you know we had a plan that he would he said he would stay back you know continue with the fellowship while i would go and serve and also we had a plan that at least in my absence the fellowship would continue I just started having this unrest in my spirit, like I was not meant to go. So I waited back, all my colleagues, they went, and I waited back to continue with the fellowship. And the Holy Spirit said I should go on a 40-day fast and pr to pray and birth the next phase of my assignment. And I remember in that season, I mean, no more salary. In fact, I had to stay with someone to squat with a new intern. I had to squat. In that season, there was no money. There was no money coming from home, money from internship. We had used most of it to do ministry work. There was, I mean, like, I literally was living on nothing. And in that season, I was fasting. There would be days that I would want to break, that there would be nothing to eat. That literally, the only thing I had to break my fast with was like Gary. And it felt like I was in a very terrible, tough season. But I knew the Lord said to wait. At least if I had gone for youth service, the government would have been paying me a stipend. I mean, the younger, at all, at all, I ain't bad pass. The younger would not have me. But then in that season of my life, I can't tell you how much the Lord revealed to me the next years of my life. It was in that season the Lord told me that I'll be co I'll, I'm going to have an international ministry go to the United Kingdom in less than five years. I remember... It was after we, we, we had a prayer meeting in church. After the prayer meeting, I went to visit my spiritual mother to just greet her, and then she switched to the prophetic. And she started talking about what God is going to do in the coming years, saying that she sees me you know, in the United Kingdom ministering to people from there. Those, I mean, these were just words that she was confirming what God had told me in that season of fast. And in that season, it felt like my life was actually stuck, like I was at a point. Nobody knew me. Nobody knew my voice. I just knew that I had a word from the Lord. I had a promise from the Lord. It was a season of promise, but I'm grateful that, you know, what used to be a promise is now a manifestation. Even if it was just one person that sat in this room, it would have still, it would have still been a, a proof of God's faithfulness. That if God gives a word, it will back it up. And this is just the beginning of greater things. This is just the, I'm telling you, this is the beginning of greater things because the pictures, the revelation God has revealed to us is way bigger than where we are now. We don't despise the days of humble beginning. And I remember, I can't, you know, as soon as that word came, the following month, I started applying. I, started, I, I didn't have a passport. I went to apply for a passport, but I never used the passport. <laughs> when I got married, I had to change, you know, change names. So I had to get a new passport. This, uh, we moved to the United States of America and back there too. 
the unrest started again, like, oh, you have something to do. You have an assignment here. My husband and I were in an intense season of fasting and prayer, and we started our ministry over there. We're doing well by the grace of God. Um, the ministry is growing. But I just want to say to someone probably listening to me and at a season of their life, in a season of their life where they feel, oh, they are stuck or nothing is happening. God has made so much promises. God has said great and mighty things about your future, but it doesn't look like it. I want you to know that God is a promise keeper. Oh. Me standing here today, God is a promise keeper. God, and let me tell you, the doors to the nations have opened. And we did not even have to force it, honestly. If I want to go to Canada tomorrow, now all I need to do is book a flight. That was seen, I remember in that season, in a day when I was fasting, I would lock up myself in a place like this. It was, um, we had a chapel. You know, most people would be at work. It would just be only me in the chapel. I would be there. I would lock myself. I would wake up around maybe 7 in the morning. I will pray to like maybe 9 or 10. Then once I'm done, have my bath, I'll go and lock myself in the chapel and sometimes I'll be there from like 11 in the morning to like 7 p.m. at night and all I'm doing is studying God's word, praying, reading books and listening to messages. That was the cycle of my life for almost five months. People thought, ah, what will you be doing? Your mates are making progress. It looks like people were making progress. They were moving ahead of me. <laughs> but as soon <laughs> as I begin my run, it go be like say a day on steroids. <laughs> Elijah level, I answer it to Ferrari. Hey, it's my normal level. I answer it to Ferrari. Hey, so I'm more than able. I answer it to Ferrari. So if felt everybody was making progress and I was just stuck in the season of my life. I mean, people are doing um, youth service, they're making money, people were you know, getting a job. But God says, wait. God said to me, wait. God said, don't go. And in that season, he kept up. Retreats are very powerful. Though. It's a part of, see, if you think, oh, I'm supposed to be doing this, I'm supposed I want your mind to be zoomed away from everything that can distract you from getting all that God has for you. This meeting can define the next 10 years of your life. And you're not here by accident. Jesus was intentional in his life when he was walking through the earth. He, from time to time, he will separate himself. He will go on the mountain to pray. He will take a few of his disciples. He will, he will go on the mountain. It was his life. Check through the scriptures. That's how to live as human beings. If all you do is just, you know, go with the hustles and bustles, and work, job, school, everything, your life is just revolved around that. It's a purposeless life. I'm telling you, to make money, to have kids, to get married, life is way more than that. Life is where God wants to communicate his divine counsel to you. And you cannot hear it in the midst of noise. I'm telling you, yes, it was as if God was opening the pages of my destiny in that season. I still have the journal with me. I forgot to bring it from the United States. And for the past few days, I'm, I've just been, you know, thinking about the faithfulness of God. There are many things God has said. You know, in that season was where I met some people that are here sitting in this room. I remember that God Seekers Fellowship was when Doris came, was when Dami came. After the Lord told me to wait, they were the ones that came and continued the ministry. And today, they are still strong support system. Every instruction that the Lord has given me in life has produced a major result. I may not see it instantly in that season, but I'm telling you, just give it just a matter of time. Bible says wisdom is justified of our children. <laughs> I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. That is only that you can live. Yeah, just put it in the background and let it be playing. Reduce the volume, let it not distract. I actually, I came with a prophetic instruction from the Lord. I shared a bit of it um, while we started. And um, I mean, I'm going to go into full details now. I have a prophetic instruction from the Lord. So actually, from 2021, the Lord started telling me about um, some things, uh, Holy Spirit later, you know, started, you know, giving me more um, understanding about what the Lord had revealed to me in 2021. So I just moved to the United States also. I got married, I was pregnant, and it felt like I was going through that cycle again, like I was withdrawn from everything. You know, Nigeria for me was a very familiar environment, doing ministry. Most of the people I knew back then were in Nigeria. I had a business ongoing, family at home, everything. It just felt like my life was paused, and I moved into a new territory, a new environment, and I was like, God, why am I here? 
Like, yeah, I know you said I should marry my husband. I know you said, <laughs> like, let the plan unfold. I, I, God had to th take me through that season of birthing again. And I'm glad I did. Because in that season, God started telling me um, some major things going on in the realm of the spirit. And one of it is that the current relocation of Nigerians to the United States, to the United Kingdom, you know, to Canada and all these places, it has actually has a spiritual significance. Some of you think, oh, I relocated for school, I relocated for better life, I relocated because of the insecurity in Nigeria, I relocated because I get, got married. Life, see, it has a spiritual significance, and that's what um, the Lord was trying to tell me. He does not do things coincidentally. God is too proactive to make things happen by coincidence. In the book of, let us see Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. He says, but you, this was Jesus speaking to his disciples before he ascended. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me. Look at it. He says, one, you will receive power. He says, number two, now power will come when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And I said, when you receive power, you will be what? Witnesses witnesses are to me in in a specified location let me tell you your your destiny is location based though and you can't just be anywhere and that's why god does not just move people from one place to the other your location is also has a major role to play in your destiny you'll be witnesses of me but specify the location where there will be witnesses that god is too proactive to make things happen by coincidence God is too proactive to make things happen by coincidence. For some of you, you just say, oh, I got married and because, you know, my husband has come to the United Kingdom, I came on a spouse visa. Life, God planned your destiny way ahead of time. This location is very important. That's why you have to know why you are where you are. That there is a major assignment for you beyond what you see on the, on the surface. It says, and you shall be witnesses to me in number one, Jerusalem. It says, in, and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Say, say with me, from Jerusalem to Samaria. To, uh, sorry, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This was the plan of Jesus. But the disciples became so comfortable in Jerusalem. They started, the, the early church started in Jerusalem. They were so comfortable. Nobody was moving. But the plan of Jesus is that the gospel will move from Jerusalem to Judea to Sa God, Jesus wanted the gospel to reach the ends of the earth. But the disciples were stuck in Jerusalem. They were too used to their comfort zone. They were too used to the familiar. You know, the Holy Spirit told me while I was preparing for this meeting. He says, comfort can be the greatest enemy of a believer. When you become too comfortable, you can become so complacent. Comfort can be the greatest enemy of a believer. I know you want to live a good life. You want to, you know, get a good job, you know, get married, settle down, live well in a good place. But comfort can be your greatest enemy. Most of the greatest exploits that have happened in the scripture did not happen in the comfort zone. If Jesus had to die, he had to come down to heaven. That is him leaving his comfort zone. No great thing happens in your comfort zone. So they were happy. I mean, the gospel was prospering in, uh, in Jerusalem. In fact, they were growing massively. In Acts chapter 2, perhaps 3,000 people were added to the church. By Acts chapter 3, they increased to 5,000. They were running a mega church. They were excited. These are the days Jesus has spoken about. We are witnesses. Peter stood and 3,000 people were saved. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. In fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. They were going, they were comfortable. But that was not the original plan of Jesus. And he let us now see Acts chapter 8 verse 1. Acts chapter 8 verse 1. These were things the Lord communicated to me way back as 2021. This is 2023. So Bible says, and Saul was consenting to his death. And that was the death of Stephen. It says, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. A great persecution that God wanted to shift them out of their comfort zone. God wanted to, his original plan to come into fusion. God said, the only way I would do this is not that I'll just give an instruction. Peter, arise and go to Judea. You know, John, arise and go to Samaria. God had to use the instrumentality of persecution. 
to shake the church. The death of Stephen was not ordinary. Yes, he was a martyr. He was the first martyr. But his death was not ordinary. God used it to shake the entire church in Jews. It was a mega church. A great persecution. That a political system arose. And they began to, you know, I mean, someone like Saul of Tarsus. He started persecuting believers, putting them into prison. And Bible says they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. That was the original intent of Jesus. That the gospel will not only be in Jerusalem, it will spread to Judea, it will spread to Samaria. But God had to use the instrumentality of persecution. That for some of you, it was the instrument of admission God, God used to bring you to the United Kingdom. For some of you, it was marriage. It had, you have an undercover mission in this place. It is beyond what you are doing on the surface. A great persecution arose against the church. For some people, the reason they relocate is they think it's because of insecurity. They think it's because of the hardship in Nigeria. They think it's because of this, it's because of that. But let me tell you, God has a plan. Say with me, God has a plan. God has a plan. And that place they did not want to go to initially, the Bible says they were all scattered. They were all scattered. People are living for Canada. People are living for the U.S. People are living for the uh, United States. People are living for... It's part of the original plan of God. Way back, it was the Western people that brought the gospel to Africa. Now the Lord is turning it back around. Raising people from Africa and shooting them to the ends of the earth. He says, and they were all scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria and except, except the apostles. Now let us read verse 4 to 8. Let us read verse 4 to 8. <laughs> Bible says, therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Those who were scattered, they did not go to go and get married and start living a comfortable life. They did not go there to go and forget the original mission. They did not go there to go and fulfill their own primary purpose. Bible says they went, they, they were scattered. They went everywhere preaching the word. The Lord sent me to come and stay and arouse all of you. That you have a greater assignment in this land beyond what you are doing. Some of you came on the platform of your job. Some of you came on the basis of school. Some of you came on the basis of marriage. But God had an original plan. And that plan must be fulfilled. Say with me, that plan must be fulfilled. Say with me, that plan must be fulfilled. But I was just, therefore, those who were scattered, then Philip, then Philip, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Just one guy. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Trust one guy. That all of you, you are too much to shake the entire United Kingdom. Say with me, you are too much. I'm telling you, you are too much. You are too plenty. A guy went to Samaria. Only him, he shook an entire city. That Swansea will not remain the same because you are there. Because you will rise up in the ministry of intercession and you will take that territory for Jesus. That God is counting on you that his original agenda will be fulfilled because he has planted you in that city. And Philip, you can put your name there and the city where you came from. And Omoshe here came from the United, went to the United States and preached Christ to them. She did not go there to just go and make money. She didn't go there to go and get distracted. She didn't just go there to go and start a family. She went there and preached Christ to them. And I know some of you may be thinking, I mean, like, I'm not a pastor, I'm not called to do, um, I'm not called into the fivefold ministry. It's way bigger than the fivefold ministry. Your work is a platform for Jesus. Your job is a platform for Jesus. Your school is a platform for Jesus. That's your pulpit. It's not until you are giving a mic to stand in the front of people. Every day you need people, you meet people that are in need of the gospel. Every day God brings you in contact with the people that need the life of God that is flowing inside of you. And Philip went down. That God will look at the United Kingdom and say, I have planted believers everywhere, but nobody is fulfilling my agenda. That should not, that God should not have to send someone all the way from the United States. But God has done it. To come and stir you up. That there is a greater mission than making money. That on the way there will be destruction. I remember a few months ago, a few weeks ago, a woman called me. She sent me a message. She started a company in the United States. And um, 
she just reached out to me. Oh, sh um, Pastor Shaya, she's like, she used to be like a guardian for my husband in the United States. She reached out to me, oh, I just started this, you know, business, this, this, this. And I want you to come and, you know, do this. So she called me for an interview. I went to her office. I sat down, told me what she'll be paying me. The offer was very tempting. I looked at what, you know, comes in every, at the end of the month. And then if I add that to it, what we can do, how we can flex, how better our lives will be. And then I got home and my husband reminded me, God did not bring you here for this. And there can be distractions on the way. Let me tell you, the systems of this world, they are built to, snuff, to sniff out the life of God that is inside of you. Some of you used to be more spiritual than this when you were in Nigeria. Now, prayer is very, very difficult. Now, to stay and endure some doctrine for one hour, you're already checking time. Some of you, five minutes into the message, you're already dozing off. Once it gets here. <laughs> if you know the demons that are in this territory, you will realize that you're not supposed to be sleeping this much. Some of you think because, ah, Leicester is beautiful, the ambience. Ah, if you know the demons that are powering the city, you will realize that it's more than the beauty. You are so pretty. You remind me of your sister. You will realize that there is work to do. It's way beyond the ambience. It is way beyond. See, demons sitting on the destinies of men. Men have been insulated against God. And you are the hope of God in this nation. You are the hope of God in the city. That you are not here by accident. You are not here by coincidence. Philip went down to the city of Samaria. We are too many to shake a nation. We are too many to shake a nation. Let us see the next verse. We're going to verse 8. The Bible says, And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things that were spoken by Philip. It wasn't one person, multitudes. They heeded the things that were spoken by Philip. Let me use this opportunity to tell some of you. See, they used to say service is the pathway to greatness. Partly true, but service itself is greatness. Some of you are called into the fivefold ministry. And God is asking you to do mundane things in your local church, in your parachurch ministry, to serve the vision of another man. And you think, no, 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 no. I've been called to be a pastor, a prophet to the nations, an apostle to the Gentiles. And there is no, nobody has given you my yet, and you feel, that's why I'm not fulfilling my calling. My dear sister, you have to, you will serve your way up into the fullness of your calling. I'm going to be teaching women in my ministry platform on, 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 Thursday, on Monday, by the grace of God. You have to serve your way into the fullness of your calling. Do you know this guy, Philip, was part of the seven deacons that were ordained um, to serve tables. They were chosen in Acts chapter 6 to serve tables. Like, oh, we need people to be serving the, you know, the widows, the people in charge, people that are in need of food. S seven people were chosen. Stephen, the canon, you know, Philip. Philip was one of the seven deacons. And all he did was to serve tables. But that was a season of formation. That was a season that God had used Jerusalem to prepare him. That some of you, you spent donkey years in Nigeria because God was cooking you up for destiny manifestation. That God has made you to pass through some places in life. Your Jerusalem, Nigeria was like your Jerusalem, where you have been serving and serving, and then you get into a city, and then he stepped into the office of an evangelist. And even though by the original ordination of God, he's called to stand in the office of an evangelist, but he had to serve his way into that office. He had to serve his way into the fullness of that calling. A deacon in Acts chapter 6 became an evangelist in Acts chapter 8. That you will not just arrive on the scene, it starts with seven. That's not my message. I just burned to say that. Perhaps this multitude heeded the things that were spoken. So Philip had been groomed. For some of you, you've gone through seasons of preparation in your life. God has cooked you because he knew that he was taking you to a place where nations will hear your voice. Mm, I see the nations come to me, they receive answers from my lips. Oh, I am shining as a house on the hill, 
my greatness shall not be it's beyond my wildest dream what the lord is doing my reality my reality it's beyond my wildest dream it's beyond my wildest dream what the lord is doing my reality my reality oh there's an overflow there's an overflow abundance of favor it's a new level it's a new level there's an overflow oh abundance of blessing i've taken over we've taken over It's a new level. It's a new level. There's an overflow. Oh, abundance of blessing. We've taken over. We've taken over. Yeah. And I'm walking in abundance. Moving with the speed of the Holy Ghost, I favor. Hey, I am walking in the bonus, walking in. I'm moving with the speed. I am. I favor. Oh, I am walking in the bonus. I am the speed of the Holy Ghost. You know, Kingdom Agenda is beyond good road. 24 hours of light, 2,000 pounds a month. I remember one of our church members in the U.S. was telling me that, ah, because he used to live in the United Kingdom before he moved to the United States. He said, back then, if you have 2,000 pounds, in your account and you have a house to put your head in say you have arrived in the uk <laughs> you have arrived if that was all that you needed to you know just food on my table for some of you i said i have food on my table i live in a good family you know good roads so far as light you're not thinking of boko around again you know you know you know you know <laughs> you don't know that that i ah, finally god has delivered me from my village people oh no not only to arrive to some new set of demons in the united kingdom oh you think because this place is fine there are no demons ah you'll be sure that the demons here they are see they, <laughs> they are corporate demons <laughs> Tush demons <laughs> There are many believers in the diaspora who have lost the sense of the kingdom agenda. And that's why they give you jobs. They tell you we work on Sundays. We'll give you extra pay. They make it compulsory. They give you, make life easy for you so that, you know, giving money in exchange for your souls. You no longer have time to serve Jesus. You no longer, you only show up in church once a week or once in one month. You're comfortable, you have your husband, you have your children, you're living a good life, you have a good car, you probably have gotten a home, you're paying your mortgage, and you feel that's all there is. That's a purposeless life. A lot of believers in diaspora, they have lost the sense of the kingdom agenda. And that's why God has sent me to come and remind you, to come and stir you up, that there is more to your life than school. There is more to your life. They are eating your soul, small by little by little. They give you extra pounds. Yeah, you're checking your account balance. You're able to send money home. You have arrived. Sophia in London. <laughs> God has called us for this meeting to awaken the consciousness of believers in this place. Uh, some of you here with unusual teaching grace. Some of you here with the anointing to intercede and take territories for the Lord. That, see, let me tell you, before God can invade a territory, we need, first need to give him legal permission. 
God does not step into any territory without believers giving him legal permission. And prayer is the way we give God legal permission to invade our territory. So for some of you here, your ministry in the United Kingdom is to be intercessors. That you wake up at night, 1 a.m., 1 to 2 a.m., 1 to 2 every day, devoted, malikura tekete. You begin to intercede for the souls of men to be hijacked from the pit of hell. That God is saying yes. When Jesus saw the multitude in Matthew chapter 9, Bible says he was moved with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. I, I, I feel you. next thing you will say is that, now I've come as a shepherd. He turned to his disciples, he says, pray. Pray. The, the harvest is plentiful. He said, but pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers. That before God can send forth pray, laborers, he first needs people that will take a posture of prayer. Yes, there is harvest. Yes, the harvest is plenty. Yes, there are laborers that are needed. But the laborers will not arrive on the scene without the ministry of intercession. He said he saw the multitude and he was moved with compassion. That these people, are, they are scattered, they are weary, they are going through life. Life is not supposed to be like this, depressed, down. Let me tell you, United Kingdom is not community oriented. United States, even United States, you can be living in an apartment complex and never see your neighbor for 10 years. You may never know the person living next to you. That's not how God designed life. If you check Acts of Apostles chapter 2, Bible says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in community. Fellowship there does not mean um, fellowship with God. Fellowship with other brethren. There has to be a, you see, Christianity is a community-oriented religion. The day it becomes me, myself, and I, you are lost. And that's what this is, that's the way this system is built. In the sense that you isolate yourself from other community of believers, you begin to do life alone. Just because you cannot make money, you now have a good life. See, it is anti-Christian to despise spiritual communities. Because it is only bad things that go in, in, in quiet places, in isolated places. Check through the scripture. Oh, namarate ketele bayada. Oh, that man like John Knox will rise once again. A man that knelt down in his room and prayed and said, Lord, give me Scotland or I die. Lord, give me this nation. And the Lord gave him Scotland on his feet. There's this, I heard that in history, that in his house, that his knees formed like holes into the ground, the spot where he prayed. I remember the story of a particular young boy. They said they went to school, they went to, you know, their lecturer, their professor took them on a tour um, to see like a museum of an, an old general. Said they were there, they, they, the, 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 the professor showed them all the rooms where the man prayed this and that. I think, I don't know if it was John, John Knox or so. So they showed them the rooms where they prayed. It was like a student excursion, like they went on an excursion to see. They showed them the old man's room where he prayed and his food. And I said, when they were going back, the professor, they were about entering the bus that brought them. And the professor decided to do a head count and said, just to see if the number of people that came with him are the numbers of people, a number of people, same number of people living with him. He did a head count and realized that someone was missing. So he went back into the house where, you know, where they just showed him around. He went into the main room, the living room, everywhere. He just, uh, so he just got to the bedroom and he saw a young boy, one of them, kneeling on the floor. And then the boy was saying, God, do it again. Lord, do it again. Do you know that young boy was Billy Graham? That if you two were praying, that, Lord, what you did in the days of Evans Robert, you will do it again. They are see the nations. Oh, come to me. They receive answers from my lips. That if there is a desire in your heart, and you will take the posture, you will arise to the occasion of intercession. Let's just start from there. Because some of you, you are too shy, you are too fearful, you are not courageous to preach the gospel. You are afraid, of, how, what will a white man, how will a white man listen to me? How do I address someone? I mean, you are too shy. You don't even know how to present the gospel to a foreigner. I'm going to get there. 
And as when there is a desire, God will supply the boldness. And the boy prayed, God, do it again. And the professor tapped him on his shoulder. That boy was Billy Graham. Didn't God do it again? That the same God, you know, Billy Graham was so, was so powerful that in his time, I heard that the Queen of England used to call for him to come and give him counsel on how to run the affairs of this nation. That he was so important even in, in, the, in the hem of affairs. The Queen of England, the one that died. That's one man. Imagine. The Bible says one we overcome a thousand. Two, we overcome ten thousand. See, do you know how what how many of us can do? What how many of us can do? So also in the United States. I remember when I first went to the United States, went to greet a relative. I won't mention in case they are watching. And they are watching. I went to greet a relative and I was like, ah. It's all those things you used to do in Nigeria. Because, I mean, I was doing, well, you know, I had a ministry in Nigeria. I was an associate pastor. I was doing the Jupiter Church ministry. I used to go around colleges, hosting conferences, doing meetings. I mean, all those things you used to do in Nigeria. This is America. It's different. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Paul says the same Lord is rich over all. That the same God that made the gospel to prosper in Nigeria is also the same God in America. The God of America is not lesser in power than the God of Nigeria. And I just smiled. And think about the kind of husband I have. We just smile. When God told us to study, well, they did not believe it. And we told God, you know, the pattern in America is that when you're a black pastor, you mostly pastor black people. What you will see, all you pastor are the Nigerians in diaspora. So we told God, said, no, we don't want that. We are going to be pastors of white, pastors of black, Mexicans, Arabians, Americans, Africa, and I'm telling you, that's the way it has been. That Nigerians in our, in our ministry, I'm trying to see, people that are like born in Nigeria and then came to the United States, uh, Africa, a few, I'm telling you, a few. Jesus said, I've not come to meet people that are not in need of physicians. I've come to meet the sick. I have come to meet the sick. That Philip will go to Samaria, and it's a foreign land, and Bible says, more teaching, he did the things that were spoken by Philip. <clears throat> Do you know that in the days of Evan Robert, profanity was silenced. Bars were closed. Crimes were reduced. Evan Robert was here in the United Kingdom. Crimes were reduced. He prayed for revival. And God brought revival to the United Kingdom. They said literally that police did not have works to do, jobs to do. That if they convict someone of a crime, even in the court is where they will be preaching the gospel to the person. Are you ready to accept Jesus as your Lord? I'm telling you. <laughs> I am telling you. Now, profanity is the order of the day. I tell you. Eh, that's who I am. That's how God made me. We look for justification for homosexuality. They are passing it into law, forcing it even on believers. Bible pastors come into churches, they try to defend those things. You know, that's how God made them. It says who? Chapter 1, verse what? And the devil is controlling sectors, ruling in the hearts of men. And believers are silenced because we're being distracted. devil knows that he can't stop you, so he distracted you with a good job. Let me tell you, a good job can be from the devil. The devil knows that if he can get your attention, if he can get your, you, if he can just give you money, ah, <laughs> steady week, nice car, <laughs> good house, your own don't finish. <laughs> In your own mind, you are enjoying. We have arrived. We have arrived. We have arrived. And you are enjoying. No, that the devil has taken, <laughs> he has grabbed. Your, the, the blueprint of your destiny and replace it with pound sterling, pound sterling, whatever you call it, do dollars. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Glory to God. I believe that there's an under, undercover what God is doing in this season. So now I want to tell you about the prophetic instructions that I brought from the Lord. Prophetic instructions I brought from the Lord. I just showed you the strategic season that we are in as believers. The same thing that happened in Acts chapter 1, 8, 8 verse 1 is also happening now in this time. What happened back then is also replaying itself now. 
Now, the prophetic instruction to, all, to us believers in the Aswara, number one, don't do anything that will violate your faith. Do not do anything that will violate your faith. <laughs> See, one of the ways Satan can hinder you from taking a central role in the global revival that is about to happen is to attack your faith. Can I say Luke chapter 22, verse 31 to 32? Luke 22, verse 31 to 32. Don't do anything. See, these were clear-cut instructions from the Lord. Don't do anything that will violate your faith. I want you to see this. Bible says, and the Lord, that was Jesus talking, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Do you know what? A sifting process is, I don't know, most of you here are Nigerians. There's something we eat that is called yam flour. You know yam flour? In Nigeria, before you eat yam flour, or even normal flour, let's say you want to bake, you get flour, you want to bake, you first sieve it. Then you separate the main flour from unwanted particles. This was what the devil wanted to do to Peter. That the main substance will be removed and everything that will be left of Peter will be waste, will be a waste. Jesus said, Satan, has desired to seat you. Do you know it was upon the revelation that Peter received that Jesus said, upon this revelation, I will build my church. And the gate of it, it was a major pillar of the church. He was the one that Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom to. And that was why on the day of Pentecost, it was Peter that preached and 3,000 souls were saved. He was not any of the other 12 disciples. He had a major role to play. After Jesus left the scene, Satan had seen that. He said, the only way I can avoid this is to take this guy away from the scene. And how I will take is I will sift him. I will take the major substance away and all that will be left of Peter will be nothing. That the first attack on your spirituality is an attack on your faith. That some of you, you, you have replaced, you have re they were trying to replace the main substance with things that can fade away. What is money? When you follow Jesus, he will say to you, I'm telling you, I live a crazy life in America. I'm not saying I live an exorbitant life. My husband is a student. He's doing his PhD. He's with just him his stipend. I volunteer in church as a church admin. So another stipend. Not like we live But how we live is not reasonable compared to what comes into our account every month. Sometimes we see that there was a time we were trying to you know, get our bank statement. My husband said, can you guess how much has passed to our account in the last... It's eight months. We were shocked. Literally, we were shocked. That you can be at the center of God's will and money will never be a problem. And then you can be at the center of God's will and money can still be a problem. It's both ways. But then looking at our lives, so yesterday we were still talking about it. Said, I'm sure people will think that. How are these people living? How are these people doing it? We just came back from a trip to Nigeria. We had dynamics retreats in Lagos, in Abuja. We traveled all the way to Nigeria. We're in Nigeria for like more than six weeks. And please, if you are going to Nigeria, please go with plenty of money. <laughs> go with plenty of money. There are people that just assume that because you are in UK or America, as soon as you land, that you are picking pounds. You are picking pounds. You are entering this place. <laughs> like, how many people have called you asking you for money since you came here? That one other person would just say, Ah, because you post fine picture, you're always wearing new wigs. Please, I have a hospital bill. You know, I have a child that is entering school. How many of you, one day, if I, it's at the back of my mind, that one day I will post it that you people that you have families in America, please let them rest. That someone is in the UK does not mean they are picking pounds from the floor. Because people just have this crazy assumption. That this is a better place. You are any more. You are any. And see, may God make their their thoughts a reality in your life. That money they think you are making, may you start making it. <laughs> and we're just talking. You know, like you know, it doesn't make sense that people will be surprised at the way we live. We live by faith. Not like we earn so much. We earn so little. But the things that God closes in our front. For example, we just came back from a trip to Nigeria. This trip, this ticket, we booked it in just not too long ago. I, I'm sure people will be wondering, how do these people do it? Because we don't look like what... Well, all I'm trying to say is that money will not be an issue. And like I said, it can also be an issue where you are following Jesus. Yeah, because there was a season of my life where God said, wait. And I was hungry. I was breaking Gary. I was breaking fast with Gary. There was something that was not at the center of God's will for my life back then to write. You know, you get me? So I'm saying that the least of what God can do is money. 
So what the devil is doing to some believers is that he's sitting and he's taking away the major substance. And leave what is left of me not be a waste. And that's why your words are empty. You're trying to preach, but it lacks power. Nobody's listening to you at work. You want to preach the gospel, they silence you. Because the main substance has been removed. What is left is just, he says, indeed, Satan has asked for you. What's he bury? He has asked for you that this one, this major pillar, if Peter had been seated, he would not have stood on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 so Bible say he preached without a mic, without a, a public address system. He stood and he preached. The same Peter that denied Jesus three times to a young girl say, ah, we we'll see you with him. You did Chris. I know you can be him. I don't destroy it for you. See, three times he denied Jesus. That same guy stood. The devil had, had seen that this guy would be a threat to his kingdom. So he looked for a way. And what, how did he do it? He says, he has asked for you that he may sit you at feet. Now see the prayer that Jesus prayed. Verse 32. He says, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. I have prayed for you that one of the things that will not make your faith to fail is prayer. So that attack of prayerlessness, oh, Pastor Shea, I've been struggling since I came to this place. Prayer has been so hard. I find it hard in the morning to wake up because I walk a night shift. I, you know, I, 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 I come back home late. I find it hard to pray. Hey, my lack of road to believe Russia. It's an attack on your faith. The devil is trying to get the main substance away so that all that will be left of you is a waste. Yes, you will have money. Yes, you will have a good house. Yes, you will have a good job. But the main original intent and the original agenda of God has been seated away from you. Jesus said, I have prayed for you. I have interceded for your soul. That the, you also, he says, and when you have returned to me, strengthen the brethren. There are people who souls to you must I jack from the pit of hell. Just I have inter just as I have interceded for you, you need to take the posture of intercession for many other souls. Jesus said, I have prayed for you. Because I know that when you are restored, you will strengthen others. There are some of you in this place that should be straining other people. You are too focused on yourself. You are too focused on your job. You are too focused on your school. And Jesus said, I have prayed for you. My hope is on you. My hope is in you. That when you have returned to me, you will strengthen the brethren. So prayerlessness is an attack on your faith. They give you a substitute. <laughs> you see that? Sudden desire for entertainment more than God. That you can be, um, binge watch movies four hours on Netflix. But then 40 minutes of prayer. My, yeah, 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 yeah. The next time you wake up, five minutes have passed. Ah, that's how I was praying. Shalabara, da, 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 da. And then just to wash up. Ah, jum, okay, jum, okay, jum, okay. Money me, low me. I don't get money. Let me check how much I have. Let me convert some money to pounds. Hello, mommy, hello, mommy. I've sent it, I've sent it. It's an attack on your faith. It's an attack. You, you can relate to what I'm saying, right? I said, some people's prayer life has, is so cold like this weather. <laughs> and wait, some of you that is calling this summer, please stop. Your summer is not summery. <laughs> Where I came from, this is legit winter. Legit winter. So what will your winter look like? This is not summer. Please stop, stop calling this summer. One of my our ministry members just came, left Europe too, some weeks back. She came back, she was like, Pastor Shea, you see, I think in the morning it's like 50 degrees. Go with your jacket. I did not, myself, I was like, no, 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 don't go with any jacket. Oh, it's summer, it's summer. I came here, I said, who sent me? <laughs> I, I literally packed um, a sweater, I removed it. They said, it's summer. It's, uh, now, the summer is summering me. <laughs> not summer. Your prayer life has become so cold like the weather. You are delivered in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Daniel found himself in Babylon, but he never lost his consecration. 
Daniel found himself in Babylon, but he never lost his consecration. That you can be in the United Kingdom and you don't lose your consecration. You can be in the United States of America. For those of you watching me online, that you're probably planning to relocate to Canada, or you're even probably in Canada right now, and you're thinking, Pastor Share, prayer used to be easy when I was in Nigeria. The spiritual atmosphere was so easy. You know, as you're connecting to NSBBD, you're connecting to this, you're connecting to that. Now you're in the UK, it's so hard to wake up in the morning. See, one of the greatest, the greatest person you can conquer in life is not Satan. It is, it is, it is yourself. The moment you're able to conquer yourself, you can conquer any other thing. People find it so hard to lead themselves, and that's why they cannot lead a nation. It takes people that are well disciplined, and discipline is not imparted. It's not that I will lay hands on you now, you start becoming consistent. There has to be an urgency in your spirit every morning that wakes you up, that you need to pray. Yesterday I came in so tired, you know, I met with the team, you know, I had to meet Pastor Dale and his wife. After that, I went upstairs, so much, you know, and my husband called him, like, he prayed with me, he prayed for me, and then I was like, babe, go and rest. Go and rest. And I, I, I went into bed, actually, I went into bed. And I sat on that bed, I said, no, I jumped up. No, I'm in Leicester. Yes, we've been praying towards this meeting. Now that my feet are on this ground, I am supposed to be interceding. I jumped up from my bed, started praying in the Holy Ghost. Started praying in the Holy Ghost. Because sometimes we overcompensate ourselves with rest. It's been a long day. It's been a long day at work. It's been a long day at school. It's been a long day babysitting the children. It, let me tell you, excuses are like shoes. You will always find the ones that fit. Excuses are like shoes. You will always find the ones that fit. So live a disciplined life. Daniel was in Babylon. They wanted to give him of the king's meat. He said, no, he said, give us beans. Watch us after 10 days. In fact, he was promoted into the helm of affairs. And Bible says that he used to pray. They looked for every other thing they could use against this guy. They couldn't find. They said, let us attack his prayer life. Nobody must pray to any other deity except the gods of um, the king. And Bible says, Daniel went back into his house. He opened the window of his room as his custom was, and he knelt down and prayed. What a man. What a man. That an entire nation, an entire kingdom, they've lost their senses. And he says, see, you may be going in the wrong direction. It does not mean I will follow. Because I, there's a saying, if you can't beat them, you join them. You. He said, if you can't beat them, beat, beat them up. Gather, see, gather people to beat them. If you can't beat them, you join them. Says who? I said, see, just life. No, I don't spot this yet. It's a Nigerian thing. Life will humble you in the UK. Uh, <laughs> UK, <laughs> they've humbled you. <laughs> so, what's the first thing? First instruction? Don't do anything that will let you pray. They tell you there's a better job, you earn more money, but you weigh the chances that this will take me away from God more than it will draw me closer to God. I'd rather end little and be closer to God than earn more and lose my essence in Christ. Money is good, but there are several ways to get rich. Let me tell you, you can get rich through God. You can get rich to the devil. You can get rich through just natural hard work. Yeah. So it's not only, if you say, ah, prosperity is only God, I lie. Most of the richest people in the world, they are not born again. So what do you want to say about that? So, yeah, it is God that gives power to get wealth. The devil also gives power to get wealth. He told Jesus, he said, oh, the kingdoms of this world, they are mine, bow down to me, I will give you. They also empower people to prosper. If you think it's just God, wait, they play, just they play. <laughs> just they play. They will empower people to prosper. And another way you can get money, just simple hard work. Look at Steve Jobs now, the guy, innovated Apple. The guy is dead, he died of cancer. But Bob says that it is the blessing of the Lord that make it and that's no sorrow. God will not give you such wisdom and idea and then allow cancer to take you away. I know the blessing is the person of Christ, the person of the Holy Spirit. But the blessing also has a material possession attached to it. Bible says of Abraham that was that originally received the blessing. And the Bible says that when this guy, Eliaza, was speaking to the family of Rebecca, he said, God has blessed my servant, um, my, my master, and he's rich in cattle, rich. Put it into this context. There is no way the blessing of the Lord will be upon your life. And he will not, he will not show you in material possession. 
Yes, it is the Holy Spirit, but it also cuts across every area of your life. The Bible says that Abraham was well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed him in all things. He died at a very good old age. When God blessed, he has health. When God blesses, he has every other thing. He makes rich, and he has no sorrow. So it is not only God that gives money, the devil also gives money. Number two instruction. Number two instruction. Don't practice convenient Christianity. Don't practice convenient Christianity. Above our lesson of faith, I told you of the story of how someone called me for a good job. And honestly, honestly, ah, it's almost times two of what you know I get as a stipend. If I because I could actually do the two together, I weigh the chances. We could live a better life with this money, but no, that's not the focus. I will be violating my faith to take up this kind of work. I will be definitely, definitely. Because sometimes we think everything good, yeah, all good and perfect gifts come from God. There are some gifts, they may look good on the outside, they are not from God. Because the devil can mask up what is bad and hand it over to you as something that is good. They gave, they gave um, uh, Judas Iscariot 30 shekels of silver. Was it that from God? Was that not from the devil? To sell his master. Number two, don't practice convenient Christianity. That was Deuteronomy 8, verse 7 to 18, the New Living Translation. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 7 to 18, the New Living Translation. Yeah, this is a retreat. This is where you sit and enjoy God's word, where you pray for long without watching the time. I know some of you, you've not done this in a long time. It's a good thing. It's a good practice. We're going to be reading the New Living Translation of the New King James. Before, okay, you don't have. All right, we'll do this. Before the children of Israel entered Canaan, God had to give them some certain instructions. Before the children of Israel entered Canaan, Canaan was the promised land, you remember. God took them from Egypt, put them in Canaan. But just before they entered, God gave specific instruction because God understood that the moment when he gets to the UK, she may become too comfortable that she neglects the gospel. So, you know, let us prep her mind before she leaves. This other thing. Some of you will miss some discipleship sessions, some specific instructions from the Lord when you were moving. You were just too excited that God did not have an occasion to communicate it. Or you probably communicated you got distracted along the way. I have come to remind you, don't practice convenient Christianity. Let us see this scripture together. So we're reading to verse 18. Paul says, for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, a land of good roads and 24 hours light. Some of you, when the Lord you buy petrol for, for generator, when last it was your neighbor's generation, there, there are some places you don't enjoy to live in Nigeria. Lagos is an example. My goodness. My goodness. <laughs> there are six houses, but then there are like 20 generators. Everybody's trying to do a better pass on a neighbor. The atmosphere is being polluted. There's everything. Are you happy? The Lord has brought me into a good land. I mean, very good charge my phone. I know that the light will not <laughs> You just know. You're just confident. No more power banks. When I traveled to the US, the first time I was sending this off home, I sent my power bank to my mother. God has delivered me from all this. <laughs> God has delivered me from this life. He says, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills. God was describing the place next. He says, A land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. And that's the sincere truth. Here in this place, you may not even have a degree, you can get a good job. In America, there are many people that do not finish school, that are doing well. I'm telling you, they did not finish college. Some of them will just drop out and they still get good jobs. That is what a good land is. It's not the one that will tell you, you do B you do BSc, you do masters, you do PhD, you still be struggling for a job. 70k per month. At all at all, I in bad pass. And you want PhD. You you see people that don't PhD in Nigeria. I'm sorry, you Nigeria will dress up who are watching me online. I don't have anything against Nigeria. Because people like Pastor, you know what are you saying? Are you saying we should all jackpot? No, I'm not saying everybody should jackpot. There are some people that will stay in that land and they will prosper. Jackpot has to be the plan of God. If not, you call me and you'll be, you'll be picking trash. 
He says, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranate, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which we eat bread without scarcity. There is plenty of food. Plenty of food. <laughs> Sorry, I just remember something. <laughs> Sometimes I'm cooking in my house in the U.S. I'm like, ah, this land is too, they are too good. I remember when I used to go and probably go to the market in Nigeria. You know, you go to the market, you have to, you come back, you have to wash the tomatoes, then go and blend it in a place. You want to be very smooth. You know, give all those market women they do. Here, yeah, everything is, they have washed the meat, they have washed the fish, they have washed, everything is so clean. This is like, this, I mean, everything feels so good. You get what I'm saying, right? You buy tomatoes in Nigeria, you still wash it with hot water because the thing has mixed with mud. Like, life, is, do you agree with me that some things are just comfortable here? Why are you pretending now? Huh? <laughs> I said, you know what I'm saying? A land in which we eat bread without scarcity, in which we lack nothing. There's plenty of money. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose heat you can dig copper. Verse 10, verse 9. It says, when you have eaten and you are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Because for some of you, you feel it is your certificate that is delivering that money into your hands. He said, don't forget to bless the Lord. There is nothing any man has received that he has not been given from above. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. Some of you have lost your wonder just because you've stayed here for like two years. Mm -hmm. May we never lose our wonder. May we never lose our wonder. Wide eyed and mystified. May we be just like a child, staring at the beauty of our king. See, sometimes I just sit down and recount the faithfulness of God, where he brought me from. I don't ever want to get used to this good life. Don't just get too familiar. See, finish. And you remember, you forget that it was the Lord that gave you the good life. There was a time your greatest prayer point was God, that scholarship, God, that admission. God, let them give me the visa. The first time I went for a visa interview, ah, a mimo kako mo, ah, mo di, like chikodi, like chikodi. I went with all the things I, they said, they want to do this, how ah, we are ready. The Lord I said we should do it, like, you know, I should apply, I should do everything. So I was so confident. <laughs> Who them be? Let them come. <laughs> Arrive on the scene. The consular asked for my and this, 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 ah, just, ah. He just said, Bagaro. It was a month to my wedding. I almost collapsed. That means that meant that my husband after the wedding would you know travel because I told you that he was doing his PhD. He would travel back, we'll be doing long distance marriage. And I'm like, God, this was not what I signed up for. I've been single for too long. That's to continue long distance marriage. What kind of like single, single lady, married single? Like God, why? What's God? What are going? What is happening? I cried my eyes out. I prayed. I fasted. The Lord said, Give a seed. My I gave a um, dollar. I was praying for a wedding. God said, Give give that dollar. Let's see. And we sowed the seed. So I was so confident that me, rejection, can't happen. So I went there with confidence. Back down, I was with, and it was a month to my wedding. In fact, the pain was not because I was getting married. And it meant that I would do long distance marriage. So I came out, I cried, I cried. Oh God, you know the way you now start recounting your CD. God, I did this, I did that. I fasted, I'm a faster. I prayed, I'm a prayer. Lord, I gave, I'm a giver. You need to recount your CD before the Lord. God, ah, why it should not have been me? You should you told me to do this. You told me I should apply. I was rejected though. Instead of, I remember one day, like a week after, my spiritual father called me. Sesha, if something like this happened, you prayed about it, you trusted God. God gave you an instruction to this, and this happened. He said, it can only mean one thing. It means God is testing the strength of your character. So instead of getting bitter, he said, start thanking God. So I got home that day. <laughs> you know this song? Ah, people who think I'm not spiritual, let me not tell you. <laughs> he just said it jokingly. It was in a conversation. He said, what? When you get to know me, play, and I don't see me. <laughs> <laughs> Funny to me when he thought, even his joke is like a prophecy. Honestly, I got to my side playing and I was dancing. Me that be moody all week. 
I was not saying, but I repented after like a day or two. I started playing Sinatch. <laughs> I rejoiced. I was playing talk about love. I was dancing in my room. And while I was thanking God, the Holy Spirit said, go and check the sleep you were giving, that rejection sleep. Me, that I wanted to tear the thing. I, I cannot, I don't want rejection again in my life. I don't want to be seeing the sleep. Thank God I kept the sleep. I went back to the sleep and I saw that the rules there can actually reapply at any time. And I was told at the embassy, one of my husband's guardian that was there, said, don't even apply until like six months old. Go to Dubai. If you have someone in the UK, let them invite you so that they know that you traveled before. I said, okay, 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 okay. So we can't even think of traveling until maybe like after one or two years of marriage. So all this said, go and check. I checked, I saw that I can reapply. Instantly, I just called my husband. I saw this, I started the application all over. This was less than a month of our marriage, and I just been denied. And to the glory of God, I did the application. They gave me an emergency date that does not happen. Gave me an emergency date, and I was given three days to the wedding. So this time, I didn't cack up. <laughs> I just want, I want a simple dress. I had a wife. The same question they asked me when they rejected me was, when, was what they asked again. But thank God for wisdom. I answered. I did not lie. I answered. And I just answered in a better way. It was even my husband. I tried to because we did interview together. And then I just collected the password. Congratulations. Ah. Hmm. I, came, I came out of the place like this. Hey. Hmm. Want to you all see me? <laughs> During my wedding, during my wedding, they were playing something. No, 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 that was the song I want. I told the mom, play what's the young Lucy. <laughs> People thought I ah, was wedding that was making me happy. You know, they were giving me this. And you, you were wanting to me this. <laughs> you know that kind of thing. <laughs> I was happy. Three days after, like two weeks. You know, the funny thing, by faith, my husband already booked a ticket, even before I had the interview. So everything was going to waste and all. So that's how I went to the US. So from time to time, I recount that faithfulness, telling God, I don't ever want to forget that you were the one that brought me to this place. Because sometimes some of you forget the testimonies of yesterday, how far the Lord brought you. A season where you prayed so hard for that scholarship. You prayed so hard for that admission. You prayed so hard God, God just got visa. God just visa. And God gave you now. You have become, you become oblivious to it. You, you, you've forgotten. God is big on memorials. Just the way I'm talking about, it makes him happy. That I don't ever want to forget where you brought me from. When the children of Israel were going to cross through Jordan, the Lord told them, he told, Moses, he told Joshua, take 12 stones from the midst of the river. He says, when your children ask you in, in days to come, he said, you will remind them that this is a memorial of how God helped us to pass through Jordan. That God does not want you to have an amnesia of his faithfulness. He says, when you have eaten and you are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. God, I thank you for bringing me here. Do you know there are many people dying to have what you have? I know people that have been applying for visas for years. They have not been given. You just do it two months, you are here. Like, pam, pam. And you're like, you, know, you just get too familiar. God says, when you have eaten and don't forget. Don't forget. It's not about, you know, in our post, post, post picture on Instagram, so that you put location. Some of you, when you're in Nigeria, you don't need to put add location on your post. Now you're in that book, Leicester, United Kingdom, tomorrow, Florida, day after Canada. For almost like a year or two, I think the only time I put a location was once. People did not even know that I'd relocated to the United States. And for look, add location. <laughs> May God deliver you. Verse 11, verse 11. Verse 11. Now, see the instruction God gives. The temptation that people have is that every time God elevates them or promotes them, they neglect those certain routines, thinking they can, you know, ah, I've arrived, I don't need it again. You used to pray two hours. Now, because you're in a better place, to, you, you've turned two hours to 20 minutes. Not knowing that the same consecration that brought you to that elevated platform is the same consecration, even more, that will keep you at that spot. Now, it's difficult to fast because everywhere you go to, they don't offer you French breakfast, free food. I'm telling you, a cup of tea, <laughs> coffee place, a coffee place, latte, I don't know, yeah, espresso, oh, coffee. I'm telling you now to fast. I say, go, 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 forgive me. Continue tomorrow, continue tomorrow. You gobbed the thing. Tomorrow, they offer you chocolate. Yeah. Now, to fast till 12, like, ah, 
God. I said, I will read. <laughs> we'll continue this fasting later. The Lord told them, he said, beware that you do not forget. He says, lest when you have eaten and you are full, and you have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, verse 13. He says, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, put this into this context. Today we don't do um, cattles and you do money, you do dollars, you do pounds. He said, when your money has increased, your business is flourishing, your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, verse 14. Verse 14, when your heart is littered or pride set in, when you begin to have so much, he said pride was set in, and then you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That God, you brought me from Nigeria. Ah, ah, I will praise you forever. From do you good in the hand? He says, then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. They tell you now to give towards the cost of the kingdom. You say, ah, mean that I walk, you know, 12 hours a day. How can they be telling me to give? It is not difficult for you to give towards the cost of the kingdom. Do you know there are people that God is raising in this time that their own assignment is to be kingdom financiers. That the reason God has elevated you financially is so that you will have more to give to the kingdom. He says, now you will say, they say, let us build the house of the Lord. You say, no. How can they say it's God's money? I work f- um, f- seven, 40 hours a week. It is my, it is my, I do, I even do over 10. I work two jobs. How can they say it is the Lord's money? God says, there is nothing you have received that I'm not giving you. Don't forget where I brought you from. Don't forget the things you had to go through. Don't forget the experiences that led to this place. Now to give to the kingdom is difficult. It's difficult. Verse 18. He says, and you shall remember the Lord your God, that it is he that giveth the power to get wealth. Say after me, it is the Lord my God God. that gave me power power. to get wealth. It is the Lord my God that gave me power to get wealth. I have seen over time people adjust to the culture and the tradition of the environment they find themselves in. You are no longer well rooted in Christ. You now start, you start thinking like the people of the land you, you find yourself in. They tell you, ah, I'm, I'm homosexual, just find a way to help them. Instead of you to take that person's issue to God in prayer, that Lord, no, I can't be here, an homosexual, an homosexual will be, a gay person will be comfortable. That there is a fire they contact every time they come in contact with you. That something convicts their heart. And they come to say, I need help. I know I'm not supposed to be like this. It's because you have been taking up, hijacking their souls in the place of prayer. And devil has lost his grip over their lives. And they are looking for a solution. They are caught to the end and say, what shall we do to be saved and the next person that comes to mind is you but because you have adjusted to the culture you have adapted to the environment they are looking for a voice of correction they are looking for a voice of deliverance your your voice is so silenced it has been silenced by money it has been silenced by culture it has been silenced by netflix john chapter 1 verse 6 to 7 john chapter 1 verse 6 to 7 i can't believe that I'm still preaching. This is the first message. We say another message, but not immediately. Calm down. John chapter 1, verse 6 to 7. Bible says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. There was a man sent from Nigeria whose name was Ewade. There was a man sent from God whose name, you are a man sent from God. You are a man on assignment in this place. You are not ordinary. Bible says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Verse 7. He says, This man, not another man. Some of you, you came, you were sent by God, but you arrived in the United Kingdom and your form has changed. He says, The same man came for a witness. The same, not another man. Not a distracted man. The same man that God sent was the same that came bearing witness. But I don't lose the form of my assignment. I don't lose my consciousness of kingdom agenda because I'm now in a new, new location. I don't become complacent just because I'm comfortable. The same man that God sent came bearing witness. Hallelujah. Some have forgotten the core of their vision. Seated in this room, there are some of you that are ministry gifts. There are some of you that are inter- kingdom intercessors. There are some of you that are kingdom financiers. All you do now is buy clothes, buy wig, buy bag. With the money that is supposed to be advancing the kingdom of God. We even, they even have to preach you up to sow a seed to church. Your offering is always the least. God cannot boast and say, since he elevated you, the, your giving has changed. 
What is the point of elevating you financially if you, all you spend it on itself? Daniel was in Babylon. Oh, don't forget oh, that we, are, we have clouds of witnesses that will stand in judgment on that day. And say, I even found myself in a more difficult system. But I stood my ground for God. Joseph will stand and say, I was offered free sex. But I said, how can I do this and sin against my God? That they are giving you cheap, they are, they are, ah, no, 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 not you. Say after me, not me. Don't abandon your prayer routines for money. Don't bow to the culture of Babylon. Don't bow to the culture and the tradition of the place you are in. You are supposed to superimpose that culture with the culture of the kingdom. That a new order has come. A new king is here. Until the kingdom of this world become the kingdom of our, of our Lord Jesus. That God is counting on you. In media, in tech, in fashion, in health sector. That you are, you are, a, you are a caregiver to a patient. And the patient just knows there's something about you. There's some, yes, they say you should not preach the gospel at work. But they, they, they just cannot hold back in asking, please. I don't know what. And they just, well, you begin just a normal conversation. And it leads to you telling them about Jesus. Telling them about Jesus. And God is excited. Yeah. I knew I could put you in London. I knew I could put you in Leicester. I knew I could put you in East Milan. I knew I could put you. I mean. Glory to God. Don't be defiled by the king's mate. Um, just two more instructions because of time. I'm going to rush it. The third one is have the right company. Have the right company. The first one, don't do things that will violate your faith. They tell you, get married to a white person just so you will have paper. They do that a lot in America. If you know how a lot of Christians in America that are not bold about their faith again, because... They married someone just to get a stay. And then they divorce the person after. They do illegitimate things just to have more money so that they can send more money home. They don't have the boldness to share the gospel because they've, do, they've violated their faith too much that they lack the boldness to talk about who they believe in or what they believe in. Many, I'm telling you many, many. And they say everybody's doing it. So everybody's doing it. Is that what the will of, is that what the scripture says? Is everybody doing, is the opinion of, is the voice, uh, when did the voices of men become the voice of God? When did the voices of men become the voice of God? Number three, have the right company. Have the right company. Have the right company. Let me tell you, in this place, you cannot live an isolated life. Like I tell you, the, like I told you, the system is built in a place to make you less community oriented. It makes you less community oriented. Everyone, me, myself, and I in your big apartment, you're just there watching Netflix, you turn on your heater, it's just you. I mean, you don't communicate. They're probably the only time you come out outside your job or school is when you go to church on Sunday. Some of you don't even do midweek service again. So some people would rather watch service online. Say, oh, not church. Oh, not be church. Oh. The, advance, the advancement of technology will not take the place of spiritual community. I'm telling you. The Lord needs people he can anoint, people he can place his hands upon. What we need is not new innovations or new machinery. God needs mighty men of prayer that can place themselves in communities and he will release his anointing upon them. Because let me tell you, you need community to strengthen your convictions. You need community to strengthen your convictions. If it is only you that is doing this Jesus thing, you will become discouraged. You will become discouraged. A lot of seed of discouragement will be sown into your heart. You can't do it alone. An isolated life, you can't. I'm telling you, you cannot. Daniel had a company of friends that strengthened his faith. Do you remember? Abednego, Meshach, and um, Shadrach. That there was a time they were going to kill them. He said, give us one night. And Bible says he went to his friends and said, let us pray and seek the mercy of God that he may show us the king's dream. You need people that will help you solidify your conviction. People that will make you accountable when you are falling off. People that can take your hands up in prayer. If the only thing you do when you gather is just gist, party, eat and drink, you've not found the right company. Bible says about the apostles in Acts chapter 4 verse 23, it says, and they went back to their own company. They went back, Acts chapter 4 verse 23, and they went back, Peter and John, they went back. It says, I'm being let go. They went back to their own companions. That you cannot do life alone. They had just been threatened by the chief priest. 
They had just been threatened not to speak again in the name of Jesus. Bible says they went to their spiritual community. Who are the people you go to when you're in trouble? Who are the people you, you call for help? Who are the people that make you accountable for your spiritual life? That you are be, you are going, your prayer life is going down the drain. You have nobody you can call and say, please, can we be praying together every day? Can we have a set time where, you know, I need help? Because these days people are too, people are too shy. People are too afraid. You want to put up a form. So that people can know, ah, spiritual jugunu, spiritual. And we know, you know, they do anything. The only thing you are doing is just prayer lessons. Spiritual jugunu, spiritual jugunu. They give you my king church. Empty words. Lacks power. You have a form of godliness, but you have denied the power. Have the right company. Spiritual community. A place where you can come and charge up like this. You build momentum in the realm of the spirit. And that momentum that you build as a community can sustain you in your personal life. Do you know why you do, we do meetings like this? Because in this kind of place, God releases an unusual grace. An unusual anointed. Your momentum increases in the realm of the spirit. And you carry an... Hey, there is a grace you, you are taking back when you are going up. There is a, a grace you are taking back to your jobs. There is a grace you are taking back to your family you are leaving this place a changed man and a changed woman yeah. there is a grace that is made available when we come together in community bible says you are not you have not come to a mountain that cannot be touched but you have come to mount zion you have come the city of the living god to the company of innumerable angels those angels will not show up in your room but when you gather like this when we're worshiping the father the angels they acknowledge the presence of god and see innumerable there are angels in this room that are more than the number of people seated in this place. And do you know what they are doing? They are ministering strength. They are ministering strength. As we are praying, as we are praying, they are carrying the words of God and running with it. Bible says, bless you the Lord, these angels, who, ye to the, who take heed to the voice of his word. They run at the voice of his word. When Jesus was going to go to the cross to die, the Bible says he went into Gethsemane. He was deeply sorrowful. His soul was afflicted. He knew the pains of the cross. He was like, God, if it's possible, let this cup pass over me. But he said, God, not my will, but your will. Do you know angels came to minister to him? God, instead of him circumventing process, God released the strength to go through it. When you gather like this, there are things you are going through in your person. I, I don't know, let me find that scripture. The ones that say that angels minister to him and, you know, they strengthen him. When you are going through things, instead of you going through it alone, you gather like this. There's a supply of the spirit that comes through angels, that comes through God himself. The Bible says you have come to the church of the first one, to the spirit of just men made perfect. Hallelujah. Have the right company. Not people that you only gist with. Not people that give you, you know, you follow trends together. You fan your altars to flame in communities. Let me tell you, if you have been struggling personally in your spiritual life, in your prayer life, one of the ways to get back on track is to find a community of people where, you know, you make power available together. Bible says, as iron sharpened iron, so shall a man sharpen the countenance of his friend. So if I have been weak before, because there is a power that is being made available in a room like this, my spirit begins to draw energy. My spirit begins to draw energy. Have you seen a car? You know, I know it probably doesn't happen here in Nigeria when the battery of a car runs down one of the way you get it back up there's there's a cord you connect I don't know what it's called you connect to the head of the dead battery and the working battery and then you jump start so also when your prayer life is down when your study life is down when it looks like you are losing your consecration you just need to plug into an atmosphere where power is being made available and you are picking pa, 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 before you know you just jump up and you start running you start moving by the spirit of the holy ghost i tell you you are struggling with prayerlessness be planted in a community the right one where they can find your flame your altar to flames they can find your altar to flames and i want to use this opportunity to announce we are starting dunamis fellowship united kingdom yeah a place where you can come. It can be once in three months. It's still better than nothing. You come like this. You just know I'm, it's my day of work. 
I'm coming to build, to make power available. I'm coming to draw encouragement. Some of you, if you begin to encourage one another on how you can, to end the first way of, to end the first century way of sharing the gospel. Because the only evangelism you know is the one they taught you in Nigeria. Excuse me, co, 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 please, can I share the love of Christ with you? They say, no, we don't want to hear. You have become Jehovah's Witness on the street of London. Nobody wants to listen. You know how you used to run away from Jehovah's Witness? That's how they're running away from you. Because you've not been taught the 21st century way of communicating the gospel effectively. How many Uber drivers have you tried to preach the gospel to that? They will tell you, please, I don't want to hear. That means there's something you are missing. But when you come together, you draw encouragement. You f- Hey, you stare one another. But says, let us not, this is not the time to draw. Let me find that scripture. Hebrews chapter 10, I think verse 25. This is not the time. Do you have the Passion Translation? If you don't have, you can give me the New King James. It says, this is not the time to draw away or neglect meeting together. It says, but let us come together more often. It says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. I just quoted the Passion Translation. It says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. That is the manner of some people. Some people, they hate communities. Just say, it's just me, myself, and I. Just solo artists. The only thing person they listen to is Adele. And that's why they are down. They keep getting depressed. Hello, it's me. That's why they are down. They are fighting depression. They are always, they are always doing life alone. Oh. The last instruction in this teaching, be planted. <laughs> Say with me, be planted. What's the first one? Number two. Number three. Number four. Let me tell you, there is a global revival God is doing in this time. In the United Kingdom, United States of America, in Canada, for believers that are in the diaspora, there is a global revival that is, that is taking place. And every one of us has a role to play. If you have been shot as a missile into this nation, you have a role to play. You are not here to make money. There is more to life than raising children and making money. There is, I'm telling you, there is more. The destiny of this nation is resting on your shoulders. There is a global revival that is taking place in this time. And it is a corporate mandate, not an individual mandate. And that's why God is placing you in communities. Be planted in a local church. Thank God for a church like Pastor Dele. Most times when people tell me they are coming to Leicester, it's the church that I recommend. There are many dead cathedrals in the UK now. Even in the United States. The first time I came to the United States, we, my, we, had our, my, we had our honeymoon in Maryland. My husband was doing internship with a company then, because we live in Arizona, but then we were in Maryland for about three months. And most times when it goes to work in the morning, I would just, you know, I used to exercise in the morning, and I would just be going. I can't tell you the number of churches that grasses have grown all over, locked down cathedrals, massive buildings, and every question I keep asking myself, how did they get to this point? The best place you can find God is in the midst of his people. He says, where two or more are gathered in my name. The, the word you should underline there is in his name because two can be gathered in a mall. Two can be gathered in a movie theater. But when you gather in his name, he says, there I am in the midst of them. So even though God's presence is everywhere, his manifest presence is not everywhere. His manifest presence is in the midst of his people. The Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. He, he, wherever two or more, this is why spiritual community is important. This is why you must be planted because that is where you will find God. That is where God supplies, I mean, gives supply of the spirit to his people. There are things that are being communi- communicated to your spirit right now. You may not know it is until you get home. You will just realize that pray, prayer is a lot easier. Worshiping God is more delightful now. You will start realizing that spiritual things, your desire for spiritual things are better because there is something God has wrought in your heart in this meeting say I have been we have been praying for you you we have been praying for you I did not travel thousands of miles to just allow you walk through this door the same way you came no God is too big on mandates and let me tell you it is a corporate mandate there are some there are some warf- some of you the reason you have been engaging in spiritual warfare but you have not been winning is because you've been fighting alone. Can I see Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12? Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Let me show you something. <clears throat> Don't play church, oh. Don't play church. Don't play church. If you want to join the Dunamis fellowship, don't say it is too far. The house of your lover is never too far. The house of your lover is never too far. Some of you when you were in love, when you were dating, 
You were living in Abuja. Your spouse was living in, um, give me a place, Ilefe. Because there's no flight from Ife to Abuja. So I had to use a place that you cannot easily call. You'll be on the road for four days. You probably have to travel to Lagos first, take flight. You will spend money, you will spend. They say, ah, there's no place for you to sleep. Say, don't worry, I'll sleep in the bus. You, you were willing to do anything just because you were in love. How come the house of your lover, your greatest lover, is not too far? You just look for a church that is close to the house. And you know you are not being fed there. You are just going there to palliate your conscience. There is no life of God proceeding from the pulpit into your life. You are just there to say, Amen. The only people you are seeing, empty voices in the realm of the spirit. Dead, dead pulpits and pews. And you know that there is a church that carries life, that can infuse life into you. You say it is too far. You say the money, the train money, train ticket is too much. So why did God bless you? See this scripture. It says, for we do not wrestle. It did not say for we do not wrestle. I do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Some of you have not been winning spiritual warfare because you've been wrestling alone. It says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. There, is a, there are territorial spirits in this place that we can only conquer together, not individually. This global revival is a, it's a corporate mandate, not an individual mandate. It says, for we do not wrestle. It did not say for I do not wrestle. Spiritual warfare is supposed to be a collective work of the body. See this. It says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against, see this, principally. Even the realm of the spirit, the demonic realm, they understand the power of unity and agreement. It says, against, 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 of the darkness of this, against, so you as a person, you think in your room, you will face the territorial demons. And that's why you have not been winning the war. That's why you have not been winning the battle. Because you are facing a battalion. You are facing people that understand agreement and unity. Jesus said when a demon leaves a man, he, do, you know, he, go, he goes about in the window looking for a resting place. He says if he does not find, he goes back to take seven more wicked demons. And then they go back. If they find the, play, the house of the host to be... Ha, he said the hand of that person will be way worse. Because demonic realm, they understand the power of agreement and unity. They don't walk alone. You as a believer, you don't want to do life alone. You are wondering why you are, strugg you are struggling with pornography. You are struggling with masturbation. You are struggling because the devil got hold of you in isolation. Can you be in a meeting like this and wish, and wish to watch porn? <laughs> I'm, I'm asking you again. Uh, do you have the desire to masturbate in this place? Only bad things go in the wrong places. Don't let the devil take advantage of you. Be planted. Be planted. There has to be a community foiling your fire, fanning the flames of your altar, keeping you aglow in the spirit, making you radiant. We wrestle not. We wrestle not. He does not say I wrestle not. He says we wrestle not. Again, it is a collective mandate. It is a collective warfare. It is, it is not an individual. There are things you would do alone in your private life. But there are things that can only happen when we gather together. There are things that can only happen when we gather together. There is a life that can only be infused when you are in the company of the saints. It will not happen, on, it will not happen virtually when you are watching service online. This is why the, uh, invent, in, uh, the invention of AI cannot take the place of the fivefold ministry. G God is not going to release his anointing upon AI. He's going to release an anointing on men. I, I saw something online of uh, an AI church. Someone that was programmed to say, so people came, a man of God posted it on Instagram. People came, they were attacking him. You know, people are not happy because AI now preach because the people, the, the AI will not ask us to give Titan an offering. <laughs> I laughed in Spanish. So it's because of that and offering now. You're happy that AI is your pastor. AI does not carry the anointing of the Holy Ghost. AI does not know the mind of the Spirit. AI, Bible says, and he gave gifts to men. He did not give it to artificial intelligence. He gave gifts to men. To some he gave apostles. To some he gave pastors. See, you can program a machine and tells you what they told you to say. It is the anointing of the Holy Spirit that comes upon a man that makes him know the mind of God for his generation. Rise to your faith. Rise to your faith. I want you to begin to pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus, my faith comes alive. Hey, some of you, your faith has been attacked with prayerlessness. Some of you, your faith has been attacked 
We lack of desires for the things of the spirit. Say with me, Lord, my faith comes alive. In the name of Jesus, I do not become complacent. I do not forget where the Lord brought me from. I am planted. I have the right company in the name of Jesus. I stay in community.